Okay, we'll just give it a minute for everyone to um, come into the room. And um, Marie, if you could give us the go ahead when everyone's in and we're ready to go. Okay. Okay, good to go. All right, well, thank you everyone for coming today. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Fernando Hartwig, who is a researcher from the University of Pilatus. He has a long-standing collaboration with us here in Bristol. He's done a series of really um, interesting and important and widely used papers um, investigating uh, methods, particularly for clear trophy robust Mendelian randomization and a number of other really um, important methodological developments. So um, I'll hand over to Fernando, looking forward to uh, what you've got to say today. Thank Thanks. Uh, thank everyone for joining today. Thanks for the opportunity to present here. Since we have you know, a small number of people actually in the room physically, I, will, I feel comfortable with taking my mask off so people can understand me a little bit better. So uh, what I wanted to, to talk about today uh, is to really provide some examples to illustrate this idea that we can use uh, genetic data that is, which is getting increasingly available in epidemiological studies, not only to do like more basic science research, which is typically what some more conventional genetic epidemiology studies do, but also to address you know, sort of more directly questions of public health relevance, and you understand what I mean by that throughout the presentation. So this is just a summary of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so to start things off, let's briefly, briefly, briefly talk about genetic epidemiology and, and, and genetic data. Uh, and you know, as always, it's good to start with a few definitions of what we're talking about. Uh, so we, we can understand epidemiology as the study of the distribution of health, disease, states, and their determinants in populations. It doesn't have to be human populations, but here we're interested in human populations. This definition of epidemiology was actually elaborated by Cesar Victor, which is a researcher in Pelotas and was my PhD supervisor. And if we just stick the word genetic in there, then you have genetic epidemiology, which we can understand in a sim simple way as the study of the frequency of genetic variants in populations or subgroups of a given population and how those genetic variants relate to health uh, and, and disease. And although it is not strictly necessary to actually collect genetic data to study genetic epidemiology, for example, you can study segregation of traits in families, and this will give you some idea of the heritability of the trait. Uh, most modern genetic epidemiology studies do use genetic data and often massive data sets of genetic data. And this is the type of study we're going to be focusing on today. So by genetic data, I mean any direct measure of the genetic makeup of an individual. And by direct, I mean that genetic material was actually collected, collected and assayed in some way. And you know, we can have many different types of, of genetic variants, and uh, we often uh, talk about single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are very simple. So I think that's why we're interested in them, but it can be of, of many forms. And um, in, in, the, in the sort of current uh, state of genetic epidemiology, most studies deal with or, or have genome wide genotyping uh, data which is you know, uh, basically large scale um, um, data in terms of number of SNPs scattered throughout the genome. And as I said, this is becoming increasingly available in several cohorts worldwide because you now the costs are going down, the technology is developing and all that. So uh, now I just wanted to briefly talk about what I called standard. Uh, although this word is getting a little bit outdated now, but standard applications of genetic epidemiology. Um, and, you know, if we look at what most genetic epidemiology students would do, say, 20 years ago or, or 15 years ago, would be to test the association between one or more genetic variants, 
with you know a health outcome of interest. It doesn't have to be a health outcome, but when you're talking about epidemiology, we, we are often talking about health and disease states. And we have like two main sort of uh, classifications of studies that do this, candidate gene studies and uh, GWAS studies, and they differ regarding number of variants, the type of data that you need to do them, the cost and complexity, and the conceptual paradigm that you perform each one of them. Uh, in terms of uh, genome-wide association studies, the typical goals of those studies uh, are to identify genetic variants associated with a given phenotype. Um, and this is completely hypothesis-free. So, you know, uh, when you do that, you're really just identifying statistical associations. And from those, you try to gain some new biological insights about, you know, this disease or, or, or the phenotype that you're studying. And those insights can lead to practical applications in the future. But those practical applications wouldn't be the sort of primary goal of those studies. The primary goal would be to provide uh, sort of biological insights. And in this sense, they would be more like of a basic science kind of study. And you know, these are some uh, characteristics of GWAS studies, millions of hypothesis tests. We have millions of variants, so test association of each one of them with the phenotype. So you need to do a multiple testing correction, replication due to winner scores to establish associations. And uh, as a result, you need massive sample sizes, which means that you are that you pretty much require. Uh, but you are pretty much required to do consortium-based efforts, perhaps, you know, before this massive sort of biobanks like the UK biobank, your only option was really to do consortium-based efforts. Uh, so talking a little bit about practical impact of genetic epidemiology, as we just discussed, those studies are primarily of a basic science nature. Um, it doesn't mean that they're not useful. It just means that they are not primarily interested in providing uh, more sort of applied results. And what I want to discuss today during the rest of the presentation is ways that we can go beyond this sort of conventional approach to genetic epidemiology uh, and exploit genetic data in a way that we can understand sort of health disease processes in a more applied way. And indeed, people here are experts in doing that through Menelian randomization. But um, there is more to it than, than MR, as I hope to uh, illustrate with some examples today. So uh, now what I want to do is I will just provide, I think, five examples of applications that we can uh, do in this, in this context. One of them is MR, and the other four uh, we're going we're gonna to see. So the first one is in social epidemiology, and perhaps social epidemiology would be the last field that you would expect me to discuss today when it comes to using genetic data, apart from data randomization, of course. Uh, and I wanted to talk about ethnic-related social inequalities. Those exist in many countries, including my country, Brazil, and due to many historical processes, you know, slavery, uh, racism, and, and many, other, many other things. And these uh, result as, uh, in negative health outcomes being way more common in ethnic minorities. And this is very clear uh, uh, in, in saying the Pelotas cohorts, for example. Um, so if you want to study ethnic related inequalities, we need some measure of ancestry or, or ethnicity. And the sort of conventional way of, of measuring this in epidemiological studies is to either ask the interviewer how he or she self-identify in terms of skin color or, or race or ethnicity, or me, the interviewer, look, I look at the subject and I, I classify the subject into something. <laughs> Those measures are both subjective and they're likely prone to systematic uh, measurement error. We actually are, uh, did some analysis in the Pelotas cohorts where the population is highly mixed. And we see that um, the, your 
socioeconomic position influences how the interviewer classifies you in terms of ethnicity or skin color. So an alternative to subjective measures is to use genetics to uh, understand the ancestry of the individual. And the uh, advantage of this is that first is an objective measure, second is a quantitative measure. So I don't classify two different people, say, as you know, black or white. I, I have the sort of proportion of each ancestry for every given individual. And this is getting more and more affordable over, over time. Many people are interested uh, in, in, this, in this kind of service. So when we derive ancestry measures based on genetic data, people often call this genomic ancestry. And we can calculate that or, or estimate that uh, through a series of steps. And here are the simplified steps. So we need to have a set of genetic variants, often you know, a couple hundreds. If you have GWAS data, just like use, use the, the whole thing. But you need at least a couple hundreds of genetic variants whose frequencies differ substantially between populations of homogeneous ancestry. And those are your reference population. So you say you have a set of I don't know, 1,000 individuals that are known to have European ancestry, then that's your sort of European reference population. And you can do that for different ancestries. Of course, there are not many you know, true, truly homogeneous populations nowadays, but I would say there are populations that are at least less mixed than others. So we, we do what we can. Uh, so what, what you essentially do is you compare the genetic profile of your proband with the genetic profile of those reference populations, and you use some similarity metrics to estimate the proportion of each ancestry that your program has. So here are just some results of genetic ancestry or genomic ancestry in the Pelotas cohort. So here, let's just look at the top row of, of this figure. Can, can you see my, my, my arrow? Okay. Um, so, yeah, so here we see each one of those plots show the proportion of each one of those ancestry groups. So, for example, the first plot here shows the proportion of African ancestry according to self-reported skin color. So we see as expected that the sort of median is uh, a proportion of African ancestry is way smaller in people that self-identify as white compared to people that self-identify as black. But we see, for example, that a lot of people with not so low values of African ancestry still self-identify as white. And this relates to the fact that this measure is subjective and you know, depends on how you understand yourself and, and, and things like that. So in this other figure here, we see in this black solid line here, the probability of you self-identifying as being black according to the amount of African ancestry you have. So here in Pelotas, you have about 50% probability of self-identifying as black if you have about 30% African ancestry. <clears throat> so it's quite a low threshold. And if you go, for example, to Salvador in, in Bahia, which is a completely different region of, of the country, it's you have 50% probability of self-identifying as black if you have about 50% African ancestry, which is more like you, you, you would expect uh, in, in a way. So this shows how different um, self, um, you know, self-reported measures mean depending on, on, on the cohort that you're studying, even within the same country. Uh, so we actually applied this data to several. Uh, 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 in, in several uh, uh, analysis now, this is just one example. We're looking at the association between African ancestry and major depression in adulthood. And here we stratified the analysis according to socioeconomic position, in the first, second, and third uh, tertiles. And we see that in the third tertile, we see uh, evidence of higher risk of depression uh, among those who have higher levels of, of African ancestry. And you know, the more you have, the, the, the higher uh, 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 the risk that you have major ancestry in adulthood. 
And then we ask the question, is this association, assuming it is causal, of course, uh, mediated by skin color discrimination, which is something that we measured in, in the cohorts, and we saw that most of the association appeared to be mediated through skin color discrimination. So here we're using genetic data to address the question that is essentially social. Um, so that's example one. Yeah, go. Can I ask how, how did you how did you measure skin color discrimination? You we, we just have you know a bunch of questions that we ask them. Uh, um, how, how was it framed? I think it was something like um, I mean there are several layers to it. So we start by asking, have you ever felt discriminated? You know, like you know in a racist kind of kind of way, because there are several forms of discrimination. Uh, and then if yeah, then you know how many uh, when was the first time? Uh, uh, this did this happen the last year um, prior to the interview. So we have these different layers. I, I really don't remember like what was the exact variable that we used for this analysis. But yeah, so that's you, you just ask them. I, yeah, sorry, like, this is really, um, a little while ago, when you were saying about the observer rating effects, and that the, um, when, an, when the, sorry, when the interviewer sort of classified the participants, and the socioeconomic position of the participant affected how the interviewer classified their ethnicity. And, yeah, when you talked about that, I think you phrased it that way around in terms of causality, but I was wondering whether it was also possible that the causality went the other way. So that um, basically in terms of, because of this mechanism of skin color discrimination, whether it's not that a person's SEP interacts with their ancestry to determine how people interpret them, but rather that a person's skin color actually affects their SEP by these mechanisms. Yeah, but the, so point, the, 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 the point is that um, if I have two people, right? One of them is, and, and they are both like, say, 50% uh, ancestry, uh, Afghanist, let's say, like, then I show both of them to the interviewer, and one of them is clearly poor, the other one is clearly wealthy. Right. Then the interviewer, on average, has a higher tendency of uh, classifying the wealthy one as white and the poor one is black. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I, yeah. I was just wondering about that there's at least one reason why that might. So what we're saying relates more to the fact that on average you have <laughs> a, a higher proportion of uh, uh, you know being poor among those who are black. Mm. But what I am saying is that uh, if you uh, get someone who even though he or she is black, manages to, 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 to overcome this and, and become wealthy, uh, that person will have a lower chance of being classified as, as black compared to someone else with the same level of, of sort of, you know, a phenotypic, phenotypic traces of, 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 of being black, but poor. So kind of like, you know, Fixing ancestry constant and varying uh, uh, yeah, but I guess like even with even at like similar proportions of ancestry, people can look quite different. So maybe that's what's driving yeah. the, the eventual SEP that people take, even at a, at a conditional on ancestral proportions. Yeah, yeah, that that's 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 a hypothesis, I suppose. Yeah, yeah I mean. Uh, I mean, this is a phenotype that is really hard to measure, like, you know, comprehensively. You can always have some residual, uh, yeah. you know, variation, I suppose. The, the data that we have do suggest that this, that, that there is a, a tendency uh, that is correlated with social economic position. I, I, I wouldn't dare. Uh, go anywhere further than than what I just said, like based on the data that we have. Um, I'm not sure if that's 
the answer just yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so so um, uh, going back to, to the presentation the point i was trying to make with this is that we can use genetic data to address a question that is essentially of, of social epidemiology interest so going to the exact second example now uh, in nutritional epidemiology uh, th there are several sources of evidence that suggest that breastfeeding improves cognitive development. And of course, this is debatable, but let's just assume that, you know, this relation is indeed caused just for the purposes of the presentation. Then we can wonder why is that? Like, what would be the possible mechanisms for this association? Um, and people often postulate nutritional benefits or psychological benefits like mother-child interaction and, you know, many others. Uh, focusing on nutritional benefits, one of the plausible mechanisms for this effect would be that breast, breast milk is a source of a long, uh, I, I, I wrote long term, it should be long chain, long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids, uh, which are, you know, important for brain functioning and, and, and many sort of neural processes. Uh, here is a summary of the pathways implicated in the endogenous synthesis of those fatty acids. I, I don't want to go through this. I just want to point out here with the red boxes that at several stages of this pathway, we have this fad 2 gene you can see here. And uh, I'm just highlighting this because we're going to be looking at genetic variants in this uh, gene, just justifying why, why we're picking uh, that gene. And the question you want to ask here or to, uh, to address here is a question that people sometimes formulate as a nutritional adequacy hypothesis. And the hypothesis goes like this. In this first uh, graph here, we have the levels of uh, the fatty acids that you have through your diet or through endogenous synthesis or you know, whatever source, supplements, whatever source you have. Uh, as a child. And on the y-axis, you have levels of cognitive development. This is a very sort of non-quantitative kind of, of, of graph. I'm just illustrating ideas here. Uh, and the idea here is that if you increase your level of these fatty acids, you improve cognitive development uh, on average. But this has a limit. At some point, further increasing the levels of fatty acids does not further increase cognitive development. Some people call this law of diminishing returns. Um, and on, on this relates to the other graph here, where we have sort of four subgroups of the population. Those that have a generic profile that favors the endogenous synthesis of those fatty acids. Those are shown here. And the other group is the group that has a genetic profile that you know, is correlated with lower levels of, of those uh, fatty acids on, you know, on the other side of the figure. In black, individuals who were breastfed as uh, a child, and in gray, individuals that were not breastfed. And the, the hypothesis is that if you were breastfed, you, are, you can achieve the threshold, the sort of minimum threshold of uh, long chain uh, fatty acids required for you know, optimal cognitive development. As you can see here, both of the black bars uh, you know, reach the T, the threshold level. However, if you were not breastfed as a child, then you can only achieve this threshold if you have a genetic profile that is associated with higher endogenous synthesis of those fatty acids. So that's a hypothesis. I'm not saying that that's how the world works. That's a hypothesis. So we can understand this as following. Breastfeeding sort of buffers the uh, downside of having a genetic profile related to lower synthesis of those fatty acids. That would be the hypothesis. So we would only see an association between the genetic profile and cognitive development among those who were not breastfed. Because if you were breastfed, then you would achieve the threshold anyway. That's the hypothesis. 
And people actually looked at this hypothesis in the past. So here is a study that was uh, conducted in LSPAC using LSPAC data. The IQ was measured, I think, at age 10. Um, and they used a genetic variant in the FAD2 gene that we talked about earlier. And here, GG would be the lowering genotype. So the genotype correlated with lower endogenous synthesis of the fatty acids. So the result that we see here in terms of the association between the genotype breastfeeding and uh, cognitive development is quite what we would expect based on nutritional adequacy hypothesis. For breastfed individuals, the dark gray sort of bars here, IQ seems to be more or less you know, the same in terms of average across groups. And if we looked at individuals who are not breastfed, then they always have lower uh, uh, average IQ, which is what you would expect. And, but this is especially true in the, in the uh, lower in genotype, which is exactly what you would expect based on nutritional adequacy hypothesis. However, an earlier study did not see that at all. And in fact, they saw that in the GG group, where we would expect the largest effect of breastfeeding was actually the subgroup where you did, do not see an association. So we have those two conflicting results. Uh, one supports the nutritional adequacy hypothesis and the other one doesn't. So to sort of solve this, we set out to do a meta-analysis. Um, actually not a published studies, it was like a de novo meta-analysis. So people like did analysis from scratch and we included them published studies as well. And uh, here is just the pulled uh, breastfeeding gene interaction coefficient. And we you know, failed to see strong statistical evidence supporting uh, a, an interaction. Uh, just for curiosity, we did some, uh, we did a lot of meta regression uh, analysis trying to understand this result. And one interesting result that we saw here was that in studies with a larger median duration of breastfeeding, we saw a breastfeeding gene interaction coefficient much larger uh, than in studies with a lower average duration of breastfeeding. But I mean, this is not a hypothesis that we set out to test. This is actually a hypothesis that was generated uh, as sort of exploratory data analysis. The point here is not to convince you that the nutritional adequacy hypothesis is true. The point is just to illustrate that we can exploit genetic data to address a question that is related to nutritional epidemiology. So moving to the third example here, uh, again, uh, with breastfeeding, but now uh, with regards to obesity, observational studies suggest that, you know, if you were breastfed as a child, then you have a lower risk of uh, being obese in adulthood. I'm not saying this is necessarily true, Let's just go with that for, for, for the presentation. Uh, so assuming that this is true, like that there is an effect of breastfeeding on, on obesity risk and, uh, as an adult, a possible mechanism that people have been postulating would be that if you were breastfed, then you will better develop, better develop your satiety, satiety responsiveness, which you know, of course relates to obesity. But satiety, have genetic determinants as well. Uh, and one such determinant is the FDO gene. And indeed, many studies suggest that uh, genetic variants in the FDO gene are strongly associated with obesity. And this happens through um, satiety responsiveness. So we could ask ourselves if there is a possible interplay between breastfeeding and FTO, if we could use genetic variants in FTO to try to understand if satiety responsiveness is implicated in this association between breastfeeding and obesity. Um, so we did that in the Lotus. Um, here I'm just showing results for BMI, but we did for many other obesity measures. I'm just showing one of them for simplicity. Uh, is it, it is interesting that when looking at the association between breastfeeding and obesity, we did not, did not see any convincing evidence of an association whatsoever, as you can see here in this 
table here that I'm pointing right now. But if we look at the association between the FTO uh, variant that we studied and BMI, stratified according to breastfeeding duration, then we see a much more interesting result. For individuals that were breastfed for less than one month, and we use less than one month instead of zero because the prevalence of like actual zero breastfeeding was very small. So for individuals that were breastfed for less than one month, we see you know quite clear association between the genotype and BMI. But when we look at individuals that were breastfed for at least one month, we, we do see an association, but it's way weaker, way, way, way weaker. So this does seem to suggest that um, breastfeeding sort of buffers, the uh, partially buffers the, the obesity increasing effect of this genotype, which would be in line with the hypothesis that breastfeeding influences hypo um, obesity through satiety. So again, we are studying a nutrition epidemiology question uh, using genetic data. So now, co-inference, but not linear randomization. Uh, more specifically, genetic confounding. Genetic confounding is you know, type of confounding, like any other type of confounding. But what is special about it is that before genetic data was readily available, it was something that was very difficult to deal with. We have a few examples, uh, a few exceptions of this, like twin studies, but for most sort of large population-based epidemiological studies, dealing with genetic confounding was very, very difficult. But now we have genetic data, we can use it to you know, assess this possibility in some cases. And uh, to illustrate this, we're gonna go back to the association between breastfeeding and IQ. One, explanation that people have uh, postulated for this would be that if you have an infant that is more apt, like overall, that infant would find easier to you know, breastfeed and would also have a you know, sort of natural tendency to become you know, smart. So this would be a type of genetic confounding. And we can actually empirically assess this, and that's what, that's what we did in, in, in Pelotas, using uh, basal results from the SHGAC consortium, the second phase of this consortium, which uh, studied the genetics of Turing and, and IQ through GWAS. So from, from their results, we calculated a Leo score that's uh, you know, convincingly correlated with uh, the participants' IQ in the Pelotas cohort. And the idea is that this allele score captures in some way this latent construct of aptitude, right? Um, so if breastfeeding is associated with this allele score, then we'd be concerned that we could have genetic confounding in this, in this situation, right? So, that that's the results. So in the first uh, table here that I'm pointing at right now, we see the association between uh, breastfeeding duration and, and IQ in adulthood in Pelotas, and you know a clear sort of you know you know I don't want to say dose response, but you know as you increase breastfeeding duration, you increase uh, average IQ. And here is the association between the Leo score and IQ, and the Leo score is standardized to have. Uh, mean zero invariance one. So we can clearly see that the association between breastfeeding and the allele score does not match with the association that we see between breastfeeding and IQ. So this result would argue against the, the, the hypothesis that genetic confounding is driving the association between breastfeeding and IQ. We're not saying that this proves that the association is causal, we're just um, you know, finding empirical results that indicate that this particular alternative explanation is not very likely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is there a power issue there? Uh, is there a power issue there? Because all you're showing on the right hand side is the association between the annual scoring on Q, whereas on the left hand side you've got 
um, breastfeeding in IQ. And clearly, the only score is only going to explain the time. Oh, sorry, it should be. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. I, 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 I just, it was a typo there. It should be breastfeeding and allele score. Okay. No, the allele score is associated with IQ. Uh, here, yeah, sorry, I, I, I just wrote it wrong. It should be instead of IQ, here should be breastfeeding. Okay. Because this is what we're showing breastfeeding duration, and that and those values here in the uh, blue table, the, the values are the values of the loop score. Yeah. That, I was kind of, I hadn't even twigged that the parts are wrong. That's what I was presuming you were doing, but even when you're doing that, is there not a, um, how do you know that you've got sufficient power on the right hand side? I guess the confidence intervals. Yeah, I mean, first it's important to say that the p-value is, uh, uh, you know, does reject the null. But look at the pattern. That's my point. Uh, I, I'm not, you know, very concerned about the p-value here. I'm concerned about the pattern. Here we see, you know, increasing, clearly increasing. There we don't see that at all. So I would expect at least the pattern to to be. In, you know, more or less the same, at least in terms of direction, for uh, genetic confounding to be a plausible explanation. So that's sort of the rationale for 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 this. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Okay. So the last example, but not you know the least important, but the randomization. I think everyone here is familiar with with it, so I'm not gonna you know bore you guys even more. Uh, with 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 this, but you know, just to to mention that in MR, genetic variants are, are tools, not the object of interest. And you know, we are interested in the effects of modifiable uh, exposure risk factors, treatments, whatever. So again, this ties in with with the with the topic of the presentation. Um, you know, we need assumptions for that as you, you are all aware. Um, and the reason why we care is that if those um, assumptions hold, then your genetic variant is only going to be associated with your outcome if your exposure causes your outcome. So you know, that's why we care about that. And you know, as any instrumental variable analysis, you need assumptions. If those assumptions are violated, then you know, your results are invalid. In MR, this can happen in many ways. People are now very well aware of it. And in, in, you know, there's actually a lot of people trying to develop methods to um, make the assumptions more plausible, including myself. Um, yeah, so what I tried to do here was not to say that more conventional the more conventional approach to genetic epidemiology, conventional um, genetic association studies, I'm not trying to say that those are not important. I was just trying to present a different perspective on genetic epidemiology where we can exploit genetic data in more quote unquote applied ways. And I hope to have illustrated this with some of the examples that I shared with you today. So yeah, that's what I had uh, for, for today's presentation. Thank you guys for joining uh, here uh, in person and for everyone who is joining uh, remotely and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Fernando, that was fantastic. Uh, we have, um, yeah, a first question from the chat. I don't know, do you want to go through that one first? It was relatively early on. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, it's it's again related to the question of um, that was raised before about you know this idea that what what affects the rater in terms of you know classifying someone as as of A or B in terms of skin color and uh, I, my 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 take on this would be that. We would actually be not very well equipped to, to answer this with conventional sort of epidemiological approaches. I think we would need a more sort of qualitative study to understand this. 
sort of more like anthropological oriented kind of, of study to understand this. And then, yeah, also, so I feel like what I was saying wasn't that clear, but it was basically just related to, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of historical precedent for basically if you can pass and why you have greater socioeconomic opportunities. So that was the other possible hypothesis, that even people with the two people with identical ancestral proportions, if one of them basically looks whiter than the other, including to the interviewer, they may actually have higher SEP as a result, which would produce the same sort of interactive effect. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you're presuming that, you know, essentially residual variation in the sense of, residual in the sense that it's not captured by the measure that they're using, uh, you know, could be explaining this and you would be right. It could be either, but they're both fascinating. I yeah, yeah, they could be. You, can, you can't even look into that. Because... With the data that we have now, maybe people that have, you know, you know, more dimensions of this, more measures of this could try to, because this is essentially, I mean, in a way, is a latent construct, like not latent in the sense that uh, you don't see it, but in the sense that it's hard to like objectively measure it. It's not like height or or weight. Um, so yeah, but but I'll, 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 I'll I would stay with the position that I think qualitative studies would be very useful here. Yeah, I think I was going to go on a similar point. So as a as a, a COI, I should declare I'm like half African, half Welsh, and I have two siblings, and I'm like the brownest of them. And then my two sisters are extremely white. Um, and I think one of the things that's interesting is thinking of like, I think that basically whether you care about whether ancestry is a is a, a rubbish measure of ethnicity or whether you think that ethnicity is a rubbish measure of ancestry depends on the research question you were looking at. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Because for instance, like depression and this kind of thing, you would imagine that most like we showed that most of the effect was moderated through. Um, skin skin tone basically right or perceived perceived uh, discrimination discrimination based on yeah. skin tone. Mm -hmm. So I think I think interestingly I I grew up thinking of myself as white until I got old enough that I got brown I, I got brown as I got older for some reason. But once once I got old enough that I experienced any kind of skin based discrimination, that was the first time that I thought of myself as not white. I see. So up until see. that point, I think it would have been the case that. Ancestry would have probably captured how I thought of myself, but I think then post post that social imposition of uh, uh, an imposition of ethnicity somehow, um, then that, I mean, only only because of the example of depression. But yeah, I yeah. It's, it's interesting to think to think of which whether you think that the whether you think that the ethnicity is a rubbish measure of some kind of inherited uh, burden that may come from ancestry, or you think that ancestry is a bad is a bad measure of skin tone, which is what that, that research seems to present. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, so yeah, how you're perceived yeah. rather than how you are. How, uh, 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 I mean, of course, I cannot give an answer that, you know, uh, is going to fit in all specificities of every single possible situation. But I would say in general, uh, my, my, my perception would be that uh, genomic ancestry would be a better measure of, you know, ancestry like the, the the sort of sort of physical aspect of it uh, of course there is error there you know but i mean uh, sort of in average then say self-reported uh, uh measures of 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 ancestry i mean it is also objective in terms of like systematic bias is slightly less likely um and it's also quantitative, so it gives you more resolution in a way than conventional measures do. But yeah, I mean, in some questions, you might actually might you might actually be interested in yeah, I think you're self self, self reporting. Yeah, you're right? interested in the subjective measure because that is how you perceive. I think that there are there are instances. Yeah, but then that's how you perceive yourself, or then then or how you are perceived by others. And they'll be quite correlated. Well, it's a great thing about ethnicity being imposed. Like, yeah, I mean, they are quite correlated as well as genomic ancestry is quite strongly correlated with them as well. But presumably, we could start looking into and splitting off that genetic signal that we're getting off that ancestry into basically observable phenotypes or genetic variants that are likely to be related to observable things and things that are not observable. And you wouldn't anticipate that not observable things would necessarily correlate that strongly to your own self-perceived ethnicity, right? Because you wouldn't know. 
because a lot of the variation it does across populations has absolutely nothing to do with any externally observable traits, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I can't wait in that. I mean, uh, uh, you'll be very, uh, you'll be very responsible. I, 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 I actually don't know. I think that's a very, very complicated, complicated issue. That's very complicated for sure. And I mean, I, 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 especially now that we have, you know, sort of ethnicity-based sort of policies which are important and necessary, but that you know adds a, 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 a yet another layer of complexity to to the mix because some people you know they just you know some people just lie about it just to try Has to get some, some any discussion of that hmm? has there been any discussion of the potential of using genetic testing to assess ancestry for policy purposes yeah i think that, that there has been uh, i think this this has been discontinued and i hope it stays there because i don't i i, I don't want to like you know start like you know taking your arms your hair whatever and start like measuring you i think that's very weird <laughs> yeah but i mean it's interesting that this question is you know always raises a lot of debate even though it wasn't like a central point of the presentation i'm not criticizing the questions i'm just saying that and this often happens. Uh, it, it, it is fascinating. Yeah, yeah. And even if it is residual variation, like there's a lot of super interesting stuff going on with that residual variation. Yeah, and, and I think this is something like that touches people's uh, lives, and you know, so people do like care about it uh, more. Like, say, you know, long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids in, in breast milk or <laughs> something like that. <laughs> Okay, we've got a question from Jib. Um, shall I just read it out? For... Yeah, sure. Uh, one thing that comes to mind is the interaction on the observed scale between, e.g., breastfeeding and cognition, etc., will depend on the underlying liability model, e.g., the mapping of liability to the observed effect will be non additive. Under some circumstances, but not all specific patterns of prevalence and variance explained. So the absence of in, an interaction on the observed scale doesn't preclude joint effect, and the observation of an interaction doesn't prove that there actually is any interaction on the liability scale. Yeah, no, that, that's, I mean, that's just a general fact, right? Like that, you know, uh, evidence of effect modification depends on the scale that you use. I mean, that applies to anything, really, not, not, not just to here. Uh, what I will say about it is that in the case of breastfeeding specifically, we used a continuous measure of IQ. We didn't use like a, a binary measure. And we just assumed that like the sort of underlying data generating model was, uh, you know, linear additive. So under that model, the, the way we test interaction would be the right way. But, you know, uh, uh, it's always like the model you use, if you don't see interaction on that, that pretty much implies that there is interaction in the other scale. So, you know, uh, it's, uh, I would say that we just follow the, 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 the assumptions that seem reasonable to us in terms of like the underlying data generating model. But I mean, the comment is correct. He's, he's correct in, in what he's pointing out. Fernando, do you look at things like, uh, do you look at maternal so like the effect of maternal ID on breastfeeding. Yeah, so that's, uh, it looks like you were one of the referees of, of, the, <laughs> of, of, the, of the of the paper. They always ask for this. Uh, so uh, the, the, the result that I showed about this were generated in the 1982 cohort. Back then, like, no one had any idea that <laughs> uh, it would be important to measure maternal IQ. Um, and actually, it's funny because the 82 cohort started as a cross-sectional study. So we were not expecting to be addressing questions related to you know, breastfeeding and IQ 30 years later. Uh, but no, we don't. We don't have it. Uh, in other cohorts, we do, and we, you know, try to do some comparisons. But in the eighty-two cohort, we 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 
we don't have it. We did do some sensitivity analysis using uh, maternal schooling because you know schooling is correlated with IQ and it will be a proxy of, of it. And when we include maternal schooling on top of the covariates already being adjusted for the results pretty much don't change. So it doesn't prove you know, anything, but it's a, it's a little bit reassuring, I would say. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions in the room or um, online? Um, if not, um, could you join me to thank Fernando? I think George raised his hand. Oh, George. You... Fernando, there's a question from George. Yeah, sure. I think George, you're unmuted if you want to. Yeah. Am I, am I audible? Yeah, we can yeah, hear you, George. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's a beautiful talk, Fernando. Um, I think some of the other categories of the use of genetics um, in, the, in the public health uh, area that you discussed were what would actually come under the, at least the classification of, of Mendelian randomization as it was, uh, Ashar and I presented it in 2003, which was using the just using the special properties of germline genetic variation to help strengthen causal inference about modifiable exposures which was how we defined it i mean when the term was introduced in a completely different context by graham we uh, graham wheatley in 1991 that was in the context of a sibling study uh, abuse of siblings in a particular way to understand um the use of bone marrow transplantation which can't be usefully considered in a instrumental variables way. Um, and I think that there's the, it's actually been a considerable constriction uh, on uh, thinking about ways of using genetics to understand modifiable exposures by uh, trying to shoehorn it into an IV uh, framework. I mean, if you look at the, all the examples in, two th in the 2003 paper, very few of them can be considered sensibly IV. Because I mean, there's, uh, and especially, I mean, take the interactions, for example, if you're, uh, if you're trying to study whether smoking uh, causes bladder cancer, you know, the strongest uh, evidence uh, comes, from, uh, comes from looking at the relationship, the, the, the joint relationships between smoking, uh, a, a, a acetyl um, a, a NAT2 genotype, which is a um, genetic variant related to an enzyme, which is uh, um, a detoxifier. That's required, and um, you also have enzymes which make carcinogens out of things which aren't carcinogens. So you get effects in opposite directions, and it turns. And of course, the variant doesn't relate in any way to smoking, but you know, there's no association between the genetic variant and smoking. And your causal question is: Does this modifiable factor smoking influence lung influence bladder cancer? It's the fact that uh, amongst um, amongst people who are smokers, the genetic variant that relates to carcinogenic activation, uh, shows a relationship with, um, with bladder cancer and people who've never smoked as that genetic variant doesn't at all. So you get a qualitative interaction. That qualitative interaction is beautifully, um, is the, by far the best evidence one has that smoking influences bladder cancer. Um, but, that, uh, but the genetic variant doesn't, does not relate to smoking. So it's not an instrument for smoking. So, uh, and so I think a lot of the, um, and you know, those studies would actually be better performed in between sibling studies. So using true Mendelian randomization rather than approximate Mendelian randomization. So I think, you know, so I think these different, these categories actually, when you are using the, uh, the special particular properties of germline genetic variation to strengthen causal inference about modifiable exposures, uh, I think that is Mendelian randomization. Uh, I think, I th as I say, I think the uh, she yeah. into a, into an IV is a uh, is wrong. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, um, I'm not sure if I am in a good position to discuss about what MR means with with George. Uh, uh, <laughs> and I know it would be dangerous to not give prominence to MR in a presentation here in, in, at the IU. Uh, but I mean, jokes aside. Uh, yeah, I mean. Uh, Regardless of what we define as Mendelian randomization, uh, I guess the overall point that uh, we, we, we both and hopefully we all here agree is that genetic data can definitely be exploited in, in different ways to strengthen causal inference uh, in observational studies and also in 
in other interesting ways, as we discussed here. Um, I, I can call that a mark. I mean, um, I don't mind. But um, um, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, that would be my answer. Fernando, question from Theo? Sure. Oh, in the chat. Yeah. No. No. Which one? Uh, is this from Kurt? No, uh, no this is from Theo. About to Bear say. with me. Uh, so you uh, raised his hand. Yeah. I don't. Um, hand. That was raised oh, in error. Apologies. All right. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. All right. Is there anyone else who wants to raise their hand? Andy? Tempted? No, definitely not. All right. <laughs> um, thank you, Fernando, for a wonderful seminar. Um, it's great to have you over here, and I look forward to um, hearing your next two. So it's over the next month, you've got two further seminars, is that right? Yeah, so, you know, starting this week, I have one seminar per week. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> Same time, same place. Probably. More. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming. And um, yeah, I look forward to uh, seeing you again for Fernando's future summits. Thanks. Thank you.